imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. With your host, Kamen Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rock about music, rock and roll, and corporate power. The thing is, though, if you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree to shop and nail it. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Confidence of a hero or a fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. It's all That's like a science thing, right? Indeed, indeed, indeed. It is a science thing. It is a science place. It is a scientific fact that we are all up in your face. It is time for the one, uh, the only protonic reversal. Welcome to it. Hey, episode 211 of protonic reversal. 211. I wonder if there's some numerology there. Maybe I'll ask Trey when he's on. Oh, yeah. Uh, Trey Spruance is coming on the show, like, in a minute or two. Uh, Mr. Bungle, Secret Chiefs 3, uh, Faxed Head. <laughs> uh, what a what a guitar player. What a guy. What, a, what an awesome individual. Really excited for that. If this is your first time listening to the show, uh, we've got a lot of new listeners. Just FYI, the show is called Kona Neutron's Protonic Reversal. It's a more or less weekly, sometimes more, sometimes less uh, podcast where we talk to musicians and we, I'm using the royal we here, and we find out uh, why you do what you do and things along those lines. So that's what this show is, protonicreversal.com for the archives. You can find it anywhere, anywhere really, uh, that you find your podcasts. And uh, thanks for joining us. So without further ado, you're not here to hear me talk. You're here to hear the wizard, hear the man, uh, Trace Prudence. So let's dig right into it. And yeah, sounds good. Cool. All right, and we are live with the man, the myth, the legend himself, Trace Bruance. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Good to see you again. We, we were just saying that uh, it's been a, it's been a while since we talked. Uh, I, I mean, did we clock it? Did we clock it at six years? Something along those lines. It was before this show existed. I know that. Yeah, no, it's longer ago than that. T- I think. Time is meaningless. Yeah, it might be eight years. Yeah. I don't, I mean, who knows anymore, right? But the the entire world has uh, has changed in in so oh so many ways since then. Well, I mean, it's still very young compared. To like, a, you know, we're I'm just we're putting out a record of music that was made 35 years ago. So six years, eight years, what's the difference? Very timely, very timely. Yeah. So, and that's something that I think is is so fascinating because you know, when I first heard what you guys were up to, I, w- I was like, wait, they're releasing a demo? Like, what 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 are they doing? So, but you you kind of went back and revisited all the uh, Easter Bunny stuff from way back when. And what was your thoughts with the, like going back, going back in time that way? I mean, were you sort of like, Oh, that's interesting that I did that. Or why did I do that? Or what were we thinking? Like, was there a lot of rearrangement that needed to be done? Was it kind of straightforward? What did you feel about that? No. Yeah. We didn't want to do any rearranging or anything different than what we had originally intended to do. It just never never happened you know we never had a uh i don't know a good document of of the of what the band was about at that time it was a very shitty recording you know plus it just we changed and we started exploring immediately after we made the you know after the foundational beginning of the band which was this fucking thrash metal band um right you had those roots yeah i mean that was it was full on but then we just switched and, you know, it took us years to sort of find our, um, find our home and the eclectic genre sort of stuff that we, we did. So, you know, all of that stuff in the meantime, got piled on top of this, this metal foundation and forgotten. It was forgotten about by everybody but us. Sure, because there were, yeah, right, because there's certainly heavier elements of a lot of what you guys did, but then you also were bringing in other influence, trying different things. And yeah, the first thing I thought of when I heard it, I was like, oh, this is, this is, this is pretty thrashy, you know, if, I don't know if thrashy is the proper term, but it had that, 
it had that youthful vibe of, of you know, just really attacking things like that. And it's when it's so cool because it actually, you know, it sounds, you know, it's very, very well played. It's very, they're very well articulated compositions, but it has like a, a very, it, it sounds like it would be like a first Mr. Bungle record. So it's sort of like, oh, this is like the missing chapter that we didn't know we needed. Exactly. That's what, that's what we think, you know, and it's great that you think so. There's not a lot of, there's a few people who don't think so. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh yeah, you know. But every time it, Mr. Bungle ever did anything, there's you're you're alienating about half of the people until they finally get on board, you know. So it's about par for the course, I would say. Just by creating, you're actually <laughs> turning off some people that are not necessarily going to be along for the ride for everything that you guys do, right? Yeah, it always happened. You know, we made we made our first record and we did Disco Volante, and I mean that called the herd probably by more than half. It was probably more like seventy five percent of the people who were into that first record couldn't really follow us into Disco Volante, so, you know. Well, it was almost a challenge to you, right? I mean, that first song is just brutal. Like, it's awesome, but it's, it's if you're expecting <laughs> kind of more of the same from the first record, you were in for a <laughs> first surprise, friend. <laughs> yeah, I can't say we, we, were, uh, we weren't aware of what, what the effect that that was going to have, but also we were really just doing the music that we thought represented where we all were as a band, so, you know, we just kind of got used to the fact that, yeah, okay, we're going to be alienating a ton of people. So for this one, it's like, it, it, I think it's interesting because the way that we're alienating people this time around, which again, we never set out to do, we're always just right. trying to make the music that we like. But the way it worked this time is like, you know, people complaining about how primitive and like, it, you know, it just sounds like any, any generic thrash metal band from the 80s. And we're like, exactly because so, <laughs> that's i mean was that the kind of stuff that you guys were listening to was that the kind of stuff that you were sort of uh feel, felt you had common cause with at that time because you're in humboldt county right yeah. so it's like i mean and i love humboldt but humboldt is just far enough away from everything that you kind of have to create your own culture and that's kind of the best thing about it but it also is pre-internet that has to be somewhat lonely in, in a certain way so you're creating your own world based upon the stuff you're listening to i would imagine right Exactly. And, you know, they, they call it what? They call it the Redwood Curtain. You know, you're behind the red <laughs> curtain up there. And, uh, you know, it's also its own strange place with its own strange characteristics. So that also has something to do with it. We, we were imagining that we were a Bay Area thrash metal band, basically. Right. Sure. Because that, the, that was like the classic era of, of thrash, right? I mean, there was so much of that music that was around and it had to be incredibly exciting. So yeah, I mean, we we were totally inspired by all those bands, like you know Exodus and Possessed and all that. And but what's funny is now when we you know revisiting it in in our mind we were we were writing riffs like those bands, but you know we kind of realized like no, that they're weirder. You know, there's all this like kind of stuff. It's laying the the groundwork for what's going to come later in the band. Actually, much later. Like we go through the ska and the funk phase before we sort of find. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. Which, which also was of its era too. Right. And, and I feel like the way that uh, you guys approach that was uh, more from a devilish uh, kind of impish sort of way of like playing around with it instead of, you know, like it sounds ridiculous to say in a modern context of people that were like, no, we're serious punk rock. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> when you think of something, it's sort of true. In a way it was, you know, metal received, uh, a Mr. Bungle treatment, and then Ska received a Mr. Bungle treatment, and then Funk received a Mr. Bungle in, in treatment, and then we found out what our fucking band was about, and we started putting out, you know, our own music. Right, and and there were things that, you know, California is like a good representation of that, that you have, uh, you know, all, all the different songs, there's, you know, the kind of, the kind of Beach Boysy stuff, there's like the... the um, you know, big band from Neptune. Like, I don't know exactly how you characterize it, but there's all these, these different things that, that for you guys being like, that's the loves the pop record, like very, very clearly, but pop put through this incredible meat grinder of, of just what you guys had figured out that you like to do and that you wanted to push forward. And it kind of seemed like that was the record that the absolute uh, perfect record for you guys to make at that time, based upon where your uh, travels had come from. Yeah, and I think you put your finger on it before. It's like, you know, uh, having formed in this kind of oven it, behind the redwood curtain, um, you you get used to making up your own world, 
like you were saying. And, you know, in, by the time we did California, we had been playing 15 years. And we had been living in San Francisco for 10 years, all of us. Um, so if, if the thing that always motivated us was, was kind of not just creating your own world, but being inspired by the mysterious, you know, not being able to really understand what the X factor and certain kinds of musical things, you know, that, that's what would grab us and we would try to try to incorporate or put into our music is that sense of the kind of the marvelous, mm. the mysterious. So whatever was outside of the, you know, some the things that were easily within grasp but were, were usually things that we were going to try to to make music out of. So California was that for us when we're there in San Francisco exposed to everything in the universe and, you know, what became, I guess, exotic at that point was to try to make pop music. Was- <laughs> right. Well, totally. And in, in it, in it's, it, it came across as like, oh, this is unexpected. How cool. And it makes sense that, you know, you're talking about almost like finding that spark, right? Like, where, whereas before it was like, oh, it was, we're driven by like, yeah, we're going to be part of the thrashing, you know, up here, you know, yeah. just far enough away from people like, where? Where is that? You know, with, <laughs> with like 15 people showing up to the sh- to the show. I mean, our first show, there was a lot of bands so there was more like probably a hundred people there but yeah like, it was so isolated that let, let me tell you how isolated it was how isolated was it <laughs> it was so isolated that stage diving which you read read about in scene reports from maximum rock and roll nobody knew what it was we never saw shows or we didn't see films there was no videos everybody we knew thought that stage stage diving was diving onto the stage from the <laughs> well, but it makes sense. You can't just fire up YouTube and like watch a show, right? I mean, like if you hadn't seen it, how would you know? That's hilarious. It That's adorable. So weird. If you, I think about like there were a couple of metal bands that came through, like Wild Dogs, like this very like you know be below tertiary market tours kind of thing. And uh, you know there would be a line of headbangers right at the front, and that's, mm-hmm. like, that would be the front row, it was just like you know a line like a like yeah. football lineman, you know, like yeah, yeah. Team. Headbanging. <laughs> in, in the pose, in the pose that they're they're like ready. They're like you know the loins are girded. They're ready. They're ready for action. Yeah. <laughs> and it's seriously like you're there's like a halfback or you know going back and running half the length of the venue and diving onto the stage over the lineman, the headbanging lineman. That's what stage diving was up there. <laughs> the Humboldt stage dive. <laughs> It was, it was pretty, and then yeah, then it, then it would be just oh crawling off stage like there was no I nobody had the idea you're supposed to jump off you just kind of quietly <laughs> just crawl off the stage yeah no no the diving's the important thing it's important to dive onto the stage dive that's the rest the of it's ancillary area <laughs> <laughs> so well so that's interesting that you mentioned like you know those sort of and again we're talking about like, you know the world building right like the, the the building your own support system building your own kind of uh, lexicon your own language uh, of music and the world around it and some of that is you know maybe it's because you misinterpreted what it actually was and some of it may have been like more intentional i mean when did you have that sort of that normalization of like oh wait that's not that's not how these bands do this like was that like this kind of a bummer or was that something where it was oh okay noted yeah, you know what? I don't think we we never got that. The light bulb on that never went off. Uh, uh, we always were doing things our own our own way in our own little inbred universe. I mean, from the beginning to the end, it's been like that. This this record, the Raging Wrath, is the most conventional thing we've ever done by far. It, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, for you guys, it's pretty straightforward. I guess I should say. I mean, you know, if you is it straightforward compared to Adele? Probably not. But for, for Mr. Bungle, it's a pretty straightforward record. Yeah. Maybe not the writing. The writing isn't all that that straightforward. But for sure, the the recording, like the production thing was like really just pre-production was playing shows. You know, it was getting the band tight and having, you know, really getting that band chemistry to the point where when you hit the record button, it's it's about capturing the, the vibe of the band. That, yeah, it's a very, a very live sounding record in that way. Yeah, totally. And, this, and that's this is something that never, ever, 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 ever happened in Mr. Bumbo. Not at all. I mean, these are really like laborious processes of recording on those records. Well, because I mean, there, there are things all over the records that just the way that you chose to present the sounds was clearly an artistic decision. You know, uh, certain things where, you know, the drums come in a certain way with like a, you know, a certain type of sound or whatever to, to invoke a feeling and to invoke uh, 
other images that are associations, but maybe in a different context. So the fact that it's like a relatively, you know, for lack of a better term, straight sounding live recording is sort of like, oh, wow, like you, the career has gone in such a way that like that actually sounds crazy by comparison to the other records. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in a way, maybe we, with this, we, because we have two guys from real bands, we graduated into being <laughs> a real band. Well, and I was going to ask you, like, back in the day, you know, were you a Slayer and Anthrax fan? Like, did you did you like those bands? Oh, my God. I mean, that, that's why they ended up, you know, those guys ended up in our band is because of a kind of a fantasy, you know, the fantasy version of the thrash metal band that we were, you know, I was 15 and I'm sitting there thinking about uh, how do I get my right hand to go fast as Scott Ian's, you know? Right. And with, with drums, like with working with our drummer, Jed Watts, back then it was you know trevor mike and i were obsessed like memorizing all of the slayer records drum fills like oh, everything yeah. that, you know so these two things like you put those two ingredients together and you, you have a major percentage of what was inspiring us in 85 it's, it's both scott ian's fucking thrash riffing and dave lombardo's insane drumming yeah and it's almost like you know for for folks that play that style of music it's like there's a uh you know after slayer and before slayer <laughs> epochs of time and it's so cool to like have have that kind of come back around and have you guys have i mean basically like i mean were they were they in, there wasn't much since you were dealing with material that was older they were ostensibly session musicians i would imagine right like i mean it's sort of like they're 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 there to honor the composition and bring what they bring to it but you also don't bring scotty and dave lombardo and if you don't want them to do their thing too for sure, because you know, even when we wrote the music, again, we're we're thinking, you know, essentially, what would Lombardo do? Uh, <laughs> and, Where's that shirt? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what would Lombardo do? And uh, if you have him, you know, once because he was excited about doing it, he was very integral in it, in the idea of even taking shape. He was really part of this phase of things um, from the ground floor of it. Um, so when it you know, I made demo tapes because our, you know, the the uh, the original demo, which is on YouTube, is, I mean, the drums are inaudible. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's like there's the uh, it, drums implied, like you understand that they probably are there, but you won't actually hear them. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like luckily Trevor and I and Mike, you know, we we remember what we wrote for the drums or what we intended for the drums. Jed did a great job playing it, but unfortunately, you can't hear it very well. Um, right. So, Which is pretty key for a recording. You want to be able to hear it. <laughs> thus, I give you the reason why we went back and re-record yeah. this stuff, right? So the process of making that happen was then, um, like Lombardo made it, wanted me to make demos so that he could learn the tunes. And uh, I think he was just talking about the riffs, but, um, you know, how's he going to know when it's halftime, double time, all that stuff. So I, yeah. I make mock-ups for all my other bands, for Secret Chiefs and stuff, for all the musicians. So I just figured, fuck it, I'll, I'm going to, I'll make full drum mock-ups of, oh, uh, wow. of the tunes for him. So I just did, I, I sat again and was like, what would Lombardo do? Right. <laughs> Remembering all the stuff that everybody wrote, you know, and uh, gave him that and, you know, then just got out of the way and let him do his thing. I didn't say a word to him from that point forward about what he should do drum wise. Like it's, yeah. He's got, he's, he's an all instinct player. You know, there's yeah. no reason to fucking micromanage him. All the stuff that we took <laughs> from his records is, uh, is stuff that he kind of pulled out of his ass. Like he, he wasn't scripting all those fills. He's a, he's an improviser, you know? Yeah. So. And, and a really skilled one at that too. And that's something that, you know, it has to be somewhat surreal to, you know, kind of have things come full circle that way. And, you know, do you ever have like the moment of like, God damn it, Steve Lombardo playing <laughs> playing drums of these songs I wrote when I was a kid. <laughs> I mean, it, and I, I've played with, with Dave a few times in the in the lead up to this, but I'd never played with Scott Ian. And yeah, you can imagine the that would that was intense because, well, first of all, he's like the nicest guy in the world, and right. uh, I'm used to you know I'm used to with other projects. Um, being a band leader and having, you know, rehearsing musicians, giving them stuff, giving them direction. And especially with Secret Chiefs 3, there's a, there's a pedigree there. I mean, it's very often that we only have a day, if, if that, to rehearse before going on yeah. a whole tour, you know. 
So you don't want to waste time. You you got to <laughs> the direction has to be clear and distinct and like with no ambiguity whatsoever. I would imagine, right? Absolutely. And and the musicians have to show up to that one rehearsal like ridiculously prepared. Um, so like you know, I'm thinking, well, this is like more of a metal band, so it's probably not going to be too much like that. To my surprise, with Scott Ian, it was. At every bit up to that level of what I, I'm used to with the Secret Cheese 3, he showed up to this fucking gig prepared like you wouldn't believe. Like he, you know, he knew every single little nuance uh, of, of all of the songs um, to the point where I'm like, man, first rehearsal, we're already t thinking about like how to get our, like when we're picking at fucking 250 BPM, like getting that exactly right. <laughs> no, it wasn't about rips. You're doing your sixteenth note, like you know, crazy runs and stuff. They're like, "Well, hold on a second, we got out of sync there." You know, <laughs> immediately onto that, or I should say, I was immediately onto that because he already had all that shit perfect. Yeah. So I just matched him from that point forward. Like, man, he he's got it down, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna play this stuff and be his, be his shadow when it goes to those rhythm parts. And uh, man, it worked out so good. He, I, I was so impressed by his work ethic really good well and that is a something i wanted to talk about with the fact that you know secret chiefs 3 is so orchestrated and there's so much of a you know every every piece of it is there for a reason and does the thing that it's supposed to do but there's so much it's like a conspiracy board right there's all these interconnecting lines with all this stuff <laughs> and uh you know that's this has to be a little bit different i would imagine and you've been you know it, it's when you talk about uh, the act of creation and the, the act of uh, bringing it into the world. Those aren't always the same thing. And of course they, they say that, you know, no, no project is ever truly completed, just abandoned. Uh, go on that. Like, did you have to let go of a certain things in your mind when you went into this, as far as being like, you know, the, the director, the orchestrator, as you're used to doing. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, I knew and I cherished the idea that I wasn't going to be the director and that responsibility wasn't going to be on me. Uh, and I, what was also totally new to me was, well, not totally new because I did this in that Faith No More record, but you know, just the thing of, I'm just the guitar player and I'm only going to do guitar. I mean, that, that was never my job in Mr. Bungle either. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you, because you guys are all composing songs. You're all, uh, you know, it's, everyone is taking part in the arrangement. Like, it's not like you're just playing guitar. So that's gotta be, that's gotta be unique, right? You're not. Very unique. Suddenly it's like all guitar and it's all coming from the guitar. And then I got to do all these fucking solos, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and for me, I, with Secret Chiefs, there's a bit of that, but it's all coming from a from a completely different mindset than, you know, trying to shred like one of the 15 type of thing. Um, but to, to the credit of being 15 and trying to shred, like back then even, I was trying really like, I was doing some adventurous harmonic stuff back then. So it was like, there was a lot to dig into on this thing. So I actually had to learn how to play guitar because like, frankly, Secret Chiefs, I'll do, how, how many, you can play 600 shows, tour constantly, but it's, I know how to play this song, this song, this song, this song. I, I write music on the instrument and I switch to other string instruments that are microtonal and all this stuff. Right, right. It's, it's, it's not even traditional guitar playing, really. I mean, it's, 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 like, it's, not, not, it's, it's like a different instrument. <laughs> yeah. totally different. And, you know, I can, I can do it. That's my language and that's all great. But when it's time to like strap on a, a guitar and be a guitar player that was yeah that was all kind of new for me again i guess been well and amazing. yeah and and just to to kind of add on to that i mean was like being you know having that epiphany and, and being able to focus in that way did it, did it make you think about playing differently like what i mean if you aren't thinking about all these other things like rotating around in your brain like an orbit you know you have to be approaching the instrument differently you're the, you're the first, I've talked to a lot of people in the last couple of weeks. You're the first one to really catch that. Yes, it completely changed. Like, uh, I actually had to practice, if you can fucking believe that. <laughs> Another historic first, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not a first. I did it when I was 14. No, 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 no. But I mean, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. <laughs> I just sit down and I had to, like, you know, go through all the scales, all seven, you know, 
modes and all 12 keys and get the get the hands synced up just starting over again it was so good for me i have to say like i, I did enjoy um i mean i bought a good guitar that's another first because all of my guitars you, are absolute junk right but they're they're high functioning junk i think you described it last time if i remember correctly and i thought that was hilarious yeah that's exactly it's high functioning junk and, and I'm used to that, you know, I'm not used to having like a Lamborghini of a guitar in my hands. Uh, but I bought, I bought a Schecter, really nice kind of shredder guitar. That also, I have to say, it opened up this whole world to me because it was like, oh, that's what, what all these guitar players that do all of this, like, you know, <laughs> that's when they can do it because it's a hundred times easier when it's not a piece of junk. Yeah. So, I mean, do you find that, like, the fighting the guitar, <laughs> because, like, has be, like kind of became part of your style, and not having that was sort of like another, you know, five obstructions of like, oh no, this is too easy to play. That's very yes, exactly. I think that's that's it. I, I like being challenged and in being in kind of a mysterious world where I don't know everything that's going on as a musician when I'm improvising. But this is a different gig. It's like you have to have control over everything. So. Yeah, man, it was, a, it was a different beast completely. But it's kind of interesting, too, because with the, you know, you talk about it being like, you know, coming back to like the 15-year-old, you, you know, just, just go in as hard as you can to, to, to do the thing. And then to come back at it with all this uh, experience and all these different compositions and all this practice. I mean, did, did you find it was sort of like, is, do you almost had to get into that mindset to play that stuff? Or was it more just an academic exercise? No, you're, you totally have to go back into the psyche of, of being the 15 year old because actually I sort of lied. I did have a pretty good guitar when I was 15, which I still have, a uh, GNL F100. So that, that was a pretty good guitar. So now that I had this, uh, this other one in my hands, it helped me get back into that psyche a little bit. It even just felt like, you know, because back then all I was really focused on was playing the guitar. Like, oh, yeah, you're not thinking about composing. You're not thinking about, you know, overarching compositional process. You're just like, I want to shred. I want to shred. I mean, right? yeah, it's like there's a little bit of that com com composing and the, the, you know, theme and variation that goes on in that stuff. But for sure, it felt totally differently because I'm thinking from the instrument. That is something that I absolutely abandoned by like 88 or something. I just, I stopped thinking from the instrument of the guitar completely as a musician. So every time I've like, picked it back up again it's like when I played in the faith no more it was also kind of weird like okay I'm just playing guitar that's always been weird for me now I feel like I kind of own it because I put some time in on it and actually like practiced for a few months and it's it's cool it's fun I, I you know I feel like I can actually play the goddamn thing yeah and I think when when folks think of players such as yourself they think like oh you must have like some signature model from you know some custom builder or something along those lines so I always found it so fascinating that like you almost have this idea of it's like this is the tool to complete the job and i always thought that was such an interesting uh modus operandi yeah but yeah because for secret chiefs for example if you're doing you know the tuning systems that we use you can't there's no signature model that you know no no company has <laughs> yet, you know if the, the yeah that'd be a signature in like five dimensions right <laughs> i'll give you that kind of signature model yeah on every face of the four-dimensional hypercube <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, but th there, I've met some very interesting and wonderful people along the way who have, you know, creative people who have embraced the idea of building some of these crazy instruments and making hybrids, you know, like there's a, a main one I play on tour is a hybrid between a Dan Electra long home baritone guitar and a Saz, like a Turkish Baglama neck. Mm, mm, mm. Very, very interesting thing that a, uh, a guy had made a friend of mine had made that I bought from him just little lucky things like that along along the way you know that have enabled me to do all of this other stuff so I mean I would love to have a signature model of that made by somebody that would be amazing then I, when it cracks when the neck breaks when you take it on tour I can right. it to <laughs> well that's a good point because a lot of these uh you know I, I suppose they're called non-traditional instruments or something they they tend to be not always, but a lot of them tend to be on the more fragile side. So if you're hauling them all around the country or all around the world, I guess I should say, then there's always that fear, right? Like what if the, you know, the, <laughs> what, what if the sousaphone gets a dent in it? You know, that, that manner of, of mindset. 
No, it's totally happened. Uh, one Europe tour that we did, um, the neck on the saws broke. It was sort of common for it to crack in this one position. Uh, right. But we were chasing our tails because it takes 48 hours for the neck to dry when you put it back together and glue it with a luthier. And we were in Spain when it happened. And I'm like, okay, great. Well, this is the, the land of the luthier. Right, right. They, they, they know how to luther. Luther? Yeah, whatever. You know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> is that the term? I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Move on. Yeah, I'm not sure how to pronounce it either, to be honest. Uh, Did you have a show that night, though? Like, was it going to be ready in time for the show? The shows are booked back to back. So, you uh, know, and you're driving in between cities. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you find the luthier and they're like, oh, well, I'm sorry, but it's not going to, I'll do it, but it's probably not going to hold. And sure enough, on the second song, it snaps again. <sighs> Another luthier, you know. Every day trying to find one, you know, Madrid, the best luthier, you know, right. Zaragoza, we had one, you know, we're going all over the place looking for, for luthiers, but nothing would hold for more than, you know, a couple of songs. Crazy story. The same thing happened when we flew from, we went from Chile to Argentina. Usually the neck gets broken on the flight, you know, because it cramps. Yeah, it. that's, yeah. <laughs> this was a huge show, man. This was opening for Primus at the big... National Stadium in Buenos Aires. Mm. It was a fucking important show, and my neck is broken, and we're playing that day. <laughs> <laughs> talk, talk about the five obstructions, let me tell you. <laughs> it was a nightmare, but the incredible thing, how lucky was I? I met a, a, a man named Cadaver. Whoa. Cadaver, is the, he was the guitar tech, actually, for uh, for Larry Lalonde. From okay. Sets, also in another band called... Primus, uh, and so Cadaver is like, no, I have a trick. I know how to do it. And he, he got a uh, a card like from a deck, a playing card, like an ace card, and he put this wood glue on it, and he shoved it in um, so that you, you wouldn't have to take the whole neck apart so that the, you know it all stayed together. And he just glued it in there and leaned it up against the wall. No clamps, no fancy stuff. Huh. And he said, that'll be fine. You know, give it two hours. It'll be fine. Trust me, it'll be fine. And I was like, man, no way is that going to be fine. <laughs> right. It's like someone telling you to walk it off. Like, oh, sure. Okay, I'll walk it off. Thanks. <laughs> and what? Yeah. And was it fine? That was in 2011, and it hasn't broken since. Ah, Cadaver was that guy's name? Let's, let's, yeah. give, let's, give, let's give him a round of applause for that. That's a... I, let's put it this way. I would have been skeptical as well. I think <laughs> it's, it's fair to say. I'll never forget Cadaver, but I saw him again like a couple years later. And I told him like, man, you, you are like, you're the master. You should get a hold of Cadaver again. Let's get him again. Get him on, get him on the phone. Get him in the room. Yeah, Cadaver. Uh, okay. We got a question from the chat box. Uh, do you think you could out shred Scott Ian? Shred? I mean, Scott Ian doesn't isn't like big on solos. I've never heard him doing like any solos. So it's not even like it's not even his gig. His gig is to to hold down the fort on the the rhythm shit. And I will tell you this. Uh, when it comes to sitting there and playing like you know 240 to 50 BPM speed picking for an hour and a half, he destroys me. Like I'm not even I mean I can do it for a while, but I'm, you know. That's an endurance I'm, contest. That's the stamina up, man, for this gig. Yeah. I got the stamina up, but it was kind of because he's standing there and I have breaks and you know what my breaks are? The solos. The solos. <laughs> right, like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot, it's like, my right hand is like doing a lot less stuff and he's still over there going, you know. Yeah. So there's your answer. Like I take a break during the fucking solos. <laughs> That's amazing, but it's also true because it's like a different technique, right? Because that's all because it's all right hand when you when when you're going, and 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 it's it wears on you after a while if that's not what you do like a hundred percent of the time, like that. And this is, you know, again, we've characterized the Easter Bunny stuff as like straightforward for you guys, but it's not like it's you know sitting there playing like four or four blues. I mean, it's <laughs> like there's there's a lot going on there still. It's fucking hard for me. I'll tell you that. Like playing a show of that stuff, that's harder than any other. It's probably the hardest show i've ever played to be honest most demanding uh, instrumentally 
so how did the original idea come to and you're probably sick of answering this but i don't actually know the answer to the question which is usually why i ask stuff which is how did you come to revisiting the demo in the first place that was uh i mean i'll say first that we we all like trevor and i have had it in the back of our head that this music never got its proper you know presentation and it's like you got right because because it was it was sort of like uh it 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 was not recorded properly. Uh, it was never really released, right? So it's it's like yeah. you you have always have the idea of it of like you you heard of it in a certain way in your head, or even heard it while playing it, and then you're like, oh, it's just a drag that that never got its day, never got its due. Yeah, and it, it's the thing is that you know people who were into that music, that kind of music, were the ones who heard it were were totally into it and remembered it. Scott Ian, by the way, was one of them. He had that demo tape in '87. We found out when we got a hold of him about all of this, so it's like it made the rounds. It just sounded like shit right. is the problem, and only yeah. The, Did he uh, say you should try getting a drummer because that's <laughs> by the nature of the recording that sounds like it would be a problem. <laughs> it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. So yeah, I mean to answer your question, I guess that that was the the main thing in the back of the head, and then Trevor brought up because he had been playing with Lombardo and Phantomos and other stuff like I played with, with him with, with Zorn on a few gigs and I, I Trevor played with Lombardo quite a bit actually um he he just had that uh, the idea you know what if we got Lombardo and we did this stuff um we played the Raging Round stuff again as a band because there's always been this talk about reunion and none of it none of us ever got struck by lightning with a flash of inspiration to to do it or what the way to go about that would be until Trevor said, "Let's. What if we did this?" And then all of us were just like, "Oh my God!" Now that that is the golden, the golden egg we've been waiting for. That was a spark to to ignite it. So, and, and that's something where, I mean, I'm sure there are offers, right? Like there there were probably were offers to do things, but you know, unless it's like you know, here's twenty million dollars, it's probably not on that level. It's probably more <laughs> more of a wow, the level of effort to do this and like the level of time this would require. I mean, that's the thing. Hi. People don't really know that that part either. Yeah, like you. <laughs> did we ever have offers? It's not like I'm made of money, you know. Like I, I've been right. pretty hard as a musician. So, but even so, it's like you're going to get these huge offers. But there's no, there was no part of me that was like going to start trying to push everybody. Like, guys, let's do, let's do this reunion. We got to do it. Because I'm in financial trouble. Like, <laughs> right, I got a mortgage to pay. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Wait, none of us, none of us would sacrifice the, the legacy of the band for that bullshit, you know. So we were never even tempted by the offers. Um, and that's, I think that goes for the whole history of the band is that it's more like the inspiration has to strike. And when it does, we're going to do it. It's going to happen. If the inspiration well, and it sounds... It, it sounds like this was like, a, like I said, like a lost chapter, right? So this is a chance to just kind of accept that right and then also present this material in the way that always should have been, but also come at it as adults, come at it as musicians that have had a you know long and storied career and, and get to get to enjoy that in a different way, whereas you're probably not going to write songs like that again if you were to write a new record, more than likely, unless that was the, unless that was the, the box that you put it in. I mean, it's funny you mentioned that because the, definitely the what I've been working on with Secret Chiefs the last few years is definitely metal. Like I've oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> All right, then forget everything I just said. Sorry. <laughs> but it's different because this thing is all about going back to the thrash and that psychology of the thrash in the mid-'80s. And um, none of what I'm doing in, in metal and Secret Chiefs has anything to do with that. Well, I'd be surprised if it was. I mean, because it seems like you've got a very articulated set of concepts around everything that you do, and it all kind of fits together in a very specific way. And it almost seems like coming out from the thrash place, like you almost can't do that and honor the intent of <laughs> what that music is. And it, it's, you know, I don't want to say childlike in that way, but in a way that's almost like, oh, that's adorable. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, totally, I agree completely. It's like the, the Holy Them stuff in Secret Chiefs. Yeah, it's definitely right. not a joke at all. And it's really like, I mean, my favorite metal, uh, to be honest, is not like, uh, you know, 
party metal or anything like that, you know? <laughs> mm. Metal is definitely like this, when it's getting so dark and gloomy that maybe even the drum, there's no drums anymore and it's just so fucked and convinces you that there's something really, really, really bad going on. Something really dark and... Ominous. Yeah. That's my favorite shit, you know? I don't care about like melodic thing. I don't, I don't, I love the idea. Of, I love adding symphonic elements to metal to, to create power and textures that are, that are overwhelming and frightening. I hate the use of symphonic elements in metal for, for making melodic things or things that sound like mm. pretty and this kind of thing. Cause you know, to me, there's other forms of music that I find express that kind of stuff better or, or you know if i want to do that i have other and more effective means of doing that and for me metal is just at least as it relates to secret chiefs but really just in my own listening it's it doesn't have a really good reason to exist unless i mean why play a thousand miles an hour really fucking loud really distorted and scream your balls off if it's fun like to me it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> there's something there's something about that like to me it's about aggression and and like really like you know exploding emotions that are just fucking exploding so anyway that's the to me those are those are very two two really different approaches well tell and i think you, you hit on something interesting because it's there there is a certain type of i'm, I'm personally annoyed by <laughs> like use of of orchestration as just a I call it a cheese dick device just where it's like, why, why is that even there? Like it gives it, it gives the illusion of importance. <laughs> right. I couldn't agree more. I, I hate it so much. And that's what you get too. It's like, you know, you'll have, sometimes you'll have like a metal band and then it'll, there'll be somebody who arranged some string parts for it. And it's like this monophonic melodies that have nothing to do with anything over top of the riffs. And then, you know, a, a, like an opera style vocalist woman comes in and goes, Aah! like, okay. You know, if you wrote it from the ground up with that intention that the original riffs came from and then or incorporated orchestral elements and had those things represent the feelings that you're trying to get across with the loud screaming guitars and drums and beating the shit out of everything, then yeah, we got something. But you almost never hear that, you know, it's in fact, extremely rare so I, it's kind of this is kind of what i'm trying to do to be honest is is to widen the palette of the of the of what what could be considered metal metal i guess but do it from the ground floor up rather than attaching these artificial appendages because uh, every instrument has the ability to be frightening you know well it depends on how you use it certainly and i think what you're talking about is almost um like paint by numbers, right? Music guys paint by numbers. Like, okay, this is where this part is. Is it? This is where that part is. And that's, you know, some people like the predictable, and 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 that's you know good for them. <laughs> I guess like, you know, there's, one, there's there's something to be said for having a career playing the exact thing that people expect to hear and want to hear. You know, and and, and plenty of plugins, and there's plenty of virtual instruments, and there's plenty of programs that will write that fucking music for you. So you know. You, we 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 programmed a bot to write this power metal record yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly it's like a <laughs> have, you into, have you tuned into that uh that station the ai metal station oh it's wild yeah yeah no i you know i can't i can't believe i forgot to mention that yeah that that's sort of like a it's so philip k dick in its way yeah yeah I love uh, it because it's, it's also proves something, which is that, because there's also a very proggy element, you know, where there's people who think that if you, you know, you play this, you know, a bar of 13, 16, and then follow it with a bar of seven, eight, and then you did super fast double kick here, that you did something great. And that AI bot proves that, no, you didn't. You painted by <laughs> fucking numbers, just like everybody else. Right. Still paint by numbers. It's just the, it's just the numbers are non-Euclidean, you know? <laughs> it didn't prove a thing. It's not fucking music is what that comes down to. It's, you know, music it, it has to come really from the, from the heart, from the, you know, and the bot. I mean, it's like the old John Henry thing. I guess what we're mm -hmm. 
I'm taking John Henry's side. I'm going to be fighting against that fucking machine burrowing through the mountain. And I'll lay down my hammer and die at the end of it. But right. that's the position I'm taking. Well, I think that you, I mean, nobody can ever say that you don't have an ethos, right? You know, it, like it, it's very clear, like no matter what iteration of, uh, you know, Secret Chiefs or, or the the, ver- <laughs> the various universe of satellite bands and things along those lines, they all seem to come at it with purpose and intent. And how much is that like comes beforehand? Like, do you have like the idea beforehand? Do you play the music? And does that, ah, that, that sets your mind ablaze for that maybe this would fit in this thing over there? Like what, where, how do you, what's that sorting process even look like for you? That's a great question too. Like, I, I think during the nineties, I, um, I mean, I was experimenting a whole lot with a lot of different things. And I got to know myself to the point where, um, you know, as a musician, so that I knew how to categorize if a certain kind of idea comes. But for some reason, I have a fascination sometimes with really repetitive, minimalistic, straight eighth note music that just never stops playing eighth notes. And sometimes I, I get enchanted by something that isn't a, you know, a, a non-Western tuning system that has a non-grid kind of rhythmic concept and that, that I'll develop that on an instrument. Well, those are two very different things, but mm, they, both, mm. they both have a, a magnetism that, you know, I'll, I'll chase that down the, the rabbit hole. So that's where the whole thing of the satellite bands for Secret Chiefs came from was, you know, all these musical instincts uh, need to have a home, you know, so, so each of them, uh, I sort of developed those satellite bands as a, as a home for each of those impulses. And then when it, at the end of the day, everything is interrelated because I'm thinking in the same compositional framework, whether I'm in the mode of going in straight eighth notes and playing it like kraut rock or surf rock or something, or doing something like a, I don't know, like an imaginary Afghan metal band or something like that, you know, each, they're still, they're still related, even if they're that different from each other. And, uh, that's just because it's me doing all of it, you know? Right. Like if you were to play, uh, you know, said Afghan metal for Afghani folks, they would probably look like look at you like it came from Mars, right? Because even though it's using the, those constructs, it's come, the composition wise, it comes from a totally different place, and it's Absolutely. you know. Yeah, I'm the first to 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 tell anyone that, like, when they they say, "Oh, you know, you did Secret Chiefs to just play a bunch of Arabic music," and I'm all, I'm always telling, them, <laughs> "Oh, really? You know, take that tape down to to." your local market or wherever, a restaurant where there's Arabic people and play it for them and ask them what kind of Arabic music that is. <laughs> well, and it's, you know, there's, I think there are certain uh, cultural signifiers that, that people hear with certain instrumentation or uh, modes and, and things along, not, not to get too heady about this, but I think people just hear that and they just kind of immediately shortcut in their brain of like, ah, that's this, you know. That's the main point. That's really the point. We, we, we are the ones, we live inside this box where if we hear something outside of the 12 tone equal temperament system, we think that's either from another culture or it must be some crazy genius. Like, no, it's diatonic. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's existed for a long time, folks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Western music didn't codify into the equal temperament system until what, 14th, 15th century, maybe even 16th century. It's kind of recent development. And there's lots of great things. The other things, you know, there's lots of, there's so many great things you can do with that system. I'm not against that system. I use it all the time, like all the freaking time. But I don't understand why the thing, the two things have to be mutually exclusive. And I also will honor that there are some, there are, there are like, you know, cultural things that come along with, if you use a Saz, for example, like a Baglama, you know, that comes from the, the Turkish Makam tradition, you know, and you you don't just ignore that either because it's an instrument that's developed for that tradition. So, you know, I'll I'll admit a certain amount of a a flavor that that I work with that comes from from the instruments and and also a little bit of the nuances and the um, idioms, which are things that I just vibe intuitively. Not, they're not things that I sat down and, and studied really. I mean, you like surf music too, right? So it's like, you know, it's all part of the, it's like having a 64 crayon box versus like the 
crayon box or six or whatever it is. It's like it's having a Fender Twin Reverb and a Jaguar and going and taking close to the bridge, right? That's just, it's the same thing. That's not natural to me. I didn't, you know, nobody taught me that. I didn't, but I hear it and I like it and I want to sort of pull that into my, my sonic universe. And yeah, all that stuff all happens. And if you were to, you know, do a time travel show that goes back to like the Ottoman Empire, the Middle Ages or something, you could throw some of the stuff at them and like, yeah, they may they wouldn't have the the musical shorthand to to be like poisoned by Chuck Berry or the Rolling Stones or whatever. But even then, it's not like they're going to say like, "Oh, that sounds like traditional music." It's like, "Oh, what is this demon <laughs> music that's happening?" You know, it's just the react. Well, you might get burned at the stake. Actually, now that I think about it, but you know, it really depends on where you are, doesn't it? I, I mean, I, I've been I bought instruments in Turkey before and had people looking over my shoulder at the shops, going, "You know, what the hell is this guy doing?" Well, it's not how you do it, but it's cool. Like they're, yeah. they're, they're, you know, they're like, okay, you know, we, we, this this is this is music. It's not it's not our music. It's your music, but it's cool. You don't get this kind of shaming about cultural appropriation stuff because it's you know that 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 kind of sentiment is is something that uh, I think is foreign to the musical spirit. To be honest, I just don't think that um, music has ever done anything but traveled along caravan routes and you know whether it's instruments or or melodies or you know entire ways of thinking about music i think the most interesting regions musically like for example azerbaijan is a country that has like a daska tradition from iran superimposed with western tonalities a lot of those orchestras will have a high will have instruments that, that do the daska tunings sitting in the same orchestra with instruments like gorman that are incapable of daska that are you know in tone in the western thing and so those are you know the different musicians in those ensembles ha have techniques of smearing some of those notes so that they can work together so oh interesting okay yeah because they got to find a way to meld it in some way that <laughs> creates and, a better whole yeah that sounds suddenly as soon as you hear that you're like oh that's azari music because of these solutions, these creative solutions that musicians have come up with in these crossover culture uh, regions. And to me, that's wonderful. You know, it's like, a, it's the most exciting thing in the world to, to have worlds colliding like that and having musicians creatively solving the problems that, that come up when you, when you put stuff together like that. So then uh, there's actually a really good question from the chat box I want to get to, but before I get to that, where do you feel uh, the concept of dissonance uh, how how does that play into your compositional process, and where do you think it? How do you think it's viewed in music? Uh, you know, within you know, say Western culture necessarily, musical culture, however you want to call it, and yeah, just the overall <laughs> global theory of dissonance by Trey. <laughs> what would that be? Well, yeah, I mean, we've been through the twentieth century, you know, uh, the, the world wars. Um, I mean, it's easy to talk about how the 19th century, you know, changed classical music and tonality, and but really the 20th century changed everybody. Everybody was touched by the um, the horrors of the 20th century, and that's when you have dissonance in and of itself, you know, finally completely unveiled and um, thrown at listeners, listeners who. Some of them are horrified by that. Some of them very much understand that dissonance and that discord. I guess I'm of the school of, I don't want to pretend, I don't want to take a, a sound or a sonority that is dissonant and reimagine it as a beautiful thing. Uh, I, I believe in dissonance as such, you know, that dissonance is a, there's a reason that it exists, the tension that's invoked by certain kinds of chord, like note relationships in a chord cluster. I'm not going to redefine that as a, as a new sonority or a beautiful thing when it has perfectly legitimate power as a dissonant tension device. So I really believe in, in leaving dissonance alone and letting it be dissonant and being able to juxtapose that with things that are consonant. I just, maybe I'm old fashioned that way, but <laughs> I've never heard any of these, like, you know, when, when people say like, listen to this new sonority, it's like a chord cluster and it's, isn't that beautiful? Like, no, it's not fucking beautiful. It is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
there's people like like look at Pendereki or something, right? Like where where it's like it's like oh, it is is trying to evoke this this mood that you're not going to get that no matter how heavy heavily you orchestrate it uh, unless you have stuff crashing against each other. I mean, do you think that when Pendereski writes the Threnody for the Victims of Hiroshima, that he intends that to be something beautiful? Yeah, exactly. Really beautiful thing? <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't exactly it's fit. A, it's a wielding of dissonance for, for its appropriate gravity. It's giving, giving gravity to a piece that is heavy, fucking heavy. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's meant to be. And, and, and the dissonance gives, gives it the heaviness, too. Uh, so, cool question from the chat box. How much will Orthodox theology and Byzantine chant play in future Secret Chiefs 3 recordings and compositions? Not much, because I haven't really found a way to, to I, I, I feel like the, the Byzantine chant music is, I mean, there's been, a, I, I've learned a little bit from it, but it really is in its own context. It's not really, I don't, I don't see the point of, of trying to decontextualize church music and blend it with a bunch of things because the church music itself isn't isn't just consonant either you know it has its own right. tension and release and it's extremely advanced byzantine chant is extremely advanced first of all i'm not capable of doing it <laughs> you know, i guess there's always that sure yeah <laughs> like really just it's unbelievable but secondly yeah i don't i'm not motivated at all to try to collide that with something else um as far as the theology sure i mean that's the Orthodox theology has embedded itself into me to the point where everything that I do is in some way related to it. Um, that might seem sound weird to maybe above all to people who are Orthodox because the music I do is so crazy. Um, but I don't know. I just remind people that Dostoevsky was Orthodox too. And, you know, uh, might be hard for like super secular, um, I don't know, communists to to agree with that fact. Yeah. But when, when I read Dostoevsky, I see a great Orthodox spirit because the Orthodox is heavy. <laughs> it's like the thing we're talking about. It's not just kidding around and it's not like, oh, I feel good. I'm feeling very religious right now. Like, no, man, uh, out of respect, I leave it alone as far as the right. music is concerned. Well, and with, you know, with Dostoevsky, uh, specifically, it's almost like the commitment to the bit, as they say, that'd be the re reductive way to say it is like so all encompassing. It's like, it's like, you know, it's baked in like it's, it's, oh, you're going to read for 32 pages about, you know, <laughs> this one scene of this one thing that happened. And like, that's part of the overall thing that uh, inquisitor, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I guess I am. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> it doesn't get more orthodox than that. <laughs> good that's good that's solid uh anyway well this is yeah we're, we're heading down some some interesting paths here I, I you know it's been a it was a a long time and again you guys have played uh you know in in some manner you, you you've you know been around each other around each other's orbits or something along these times have you guys kept in touch during uh this we'll call it off period, I guess. Like, I don't know. Like what, I don't know if you call this like a redux or like, what would, like, how would you a term it, but you don't need to term it. Have you kept in touch during the time between these epochs? For the, from where we're sitting now. Yeah. For the majority of the time between California and raging wrath, this version of raging wrath, um, we've been in touch and working together. Like I did a, I did a recording with Patton, I think in 2010, with Secret Chiefs that uh, Oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um I I'm blanking on the name, but I remember that one. Yeah, that was that was interesting. Yeah. That's on to Jackie. He's he's uh he does the Jacques Brill impersonation sort of and Scott Walker. Um so that was two thousand ten. I, I played with him in Mondo Kane, I think in two thousand nine. Um prior to that I had played I played with Trevor with Secret Chiefs. He he played a couple times uh on Masada festivals and stuff and you know, I see Trevor. I, I would see Trevor periodically during that whole time. Um, the first time we were all in a room together, I think, was at a Melvin's Phantomos show. Oh, was that the the big band uh, the big band ones, or was it they 
where they were doing the the like the playing together was that just a show where they were playing together it was it was i think a big business melvin's thing oh right oh yeah i remember that one yeah that was awesome that was a that was a good that was a good show (laughs) so there was like a good eight years or something where where mike and i no it was like seven years where mike and i hadn't really spoken but all the rest of the time we've all been you know uh working together much less hanging out together and then, I mean, was there ever this idea of, of, you know, playing music together again as like a larger concept or did you, did it feel more like everyone's kind of on their own path? Everyone's like walking, you know, running their own race over here and that, you know, Hey, how's it going over there? I'm on this beam. You're on that beam. Oh, cool. Right on. Looks like a good beam. It, it was exactly that. I mean, really it's been, it's been like that for a long time. Just kind of parallel lives that dovetail every once in a while. Now after this, we're probably a little bit more close, you know, because we're actually been in this band environment together again. Um, but I expect, as you know, as mature people now, we our relationship is more like that. It's more the, the parallel tracks. It always was, to be honest. In the 90s, it was, you know, do nothing for four years, get together, make a record. <laughs> right. Four years, get together, make a record. It, you know, it's we've always been on parallel tracks. So yeah, I mean it's natural to our relationships back then, our, but our but our relationship back then were more dysfunctional, and now mm, uh, mm. we're more friends. You know, we have more actual sort of heart to heart communication now and everything, which is really nice, really a huge improvement. Yeah, would you describe that just to like aging, like getting older, and hopefully more wise? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but sort of like getting your ass kicked by life enough that you <laughs> I mean you better get your friends on one hand you know otherwise like, you have to chop all your fingers off because it's you know, it gets it get the world gets a little narrower over time and you do realize that even if you had like big um, disagreements at one point they're really small compared to the other problems that can happen in life and pretty easy to get over those things actually it kind of as as life marches on it, i'm sure it puts certain things in perspective as well like things that maybe were major beefs when you were younger it's like that doesn't matter, <laughs> that doesn't matter oh, at all. totally absolutely yeah. i mean that, you that's keep... the great thing about getting a becoming an old man well, all of us are over 50 i'm i'm 51 now so it's kind of easy to let all the stuff that used to fry you up go uh do you uh keep up with danny at all only a little bit i've been like i mean at all is your question yes (laughs) yeah i guess if you want to satisfy the intent of the inquisitor's question yes you could just say yes (laughs) (laughs) well wait a minute no i've I've been on tours with danny we've done uh the secret chiefs tour in australia which was some I don't remember, but we because he, he lives in he lives in Sydney now or something, right? It's, it's somewhere in Australia. He was living in the Blue Mountains. Uh, oh wow! He was living on like around Bondi Beach, and then he went out to the Blue Mountains, and I think he recently moved again. Um, but we did a Secret Chiefs tour with him and Dengue Fever. Like he was in a band when we went out with Dengue Fever in 2014, was it or 2011? God, so. Maybe it was 2011. Might be the last time I played with him. Which is still like nine years ago, which is crazy to think about. But, you know, t- yeah, time, time, man, it's crazy. Um, yeah, you know what? Actually, I, I think a, a friend of mine, a friend of mine was at, was uh, saw one of those shows. A, a friend of mine from uh, Melbourne, he was at that. He actually said it was an excellent show. And he brought it up to me, I think, on an episode of this show. Uh, this is a terrible story because I can't remember any of the details, but he said it was a great show, so that's the important takeaway. The, the, uh, the Australian version of Secret Chiefs is pretty, pretty cool because now you know now that both Bear and Danny live there, when we do stuff there, which again it's been a while, but yeah, it's really cool because they were there in the beginning. Uh, they know both of those guys know my musical. Better they know you. You have that almost like a telepathic shorthand. Uh, for certain things like you don't even need to like say it it's just it's it's felt somehow right absolutely like Danny is like the most gifted musician you know as far as being a drummer I mean 
I have to admit, like an embarrassment of riches when I talk about drums and Secret Chiefs or Mr. Bungle, like, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you played with some pretty badass drummers, yeah. It's so crazy, <laughs> it's so crazy. But I gotta say that, that playing with Danny, it just settles right into the, everything goes right where it should immediately. And it's all these like small things, like dynamics, really pressure, like how hard you hit mm, drums, mm. How, how much, space there should be you know when the, the symbols ringing or not and just all of that stuff like you never have to say a word to him about that stuff which is he, he's more like uh i don't know there's a drummer named matt chamberlain who I, i've worked oh with. yeah yeah good really good good dude good drummer yeah good drummer and he plays from a producer's perspective. Yeah, he's like, he's like, I mean, you know, the, the big thing is, oh, he plays it to the song. And it's like, that could mean a lot of things. But yeah, I, I know which, I know exactly what you mean yeah, when you say that. Yeah, it's this, this great drum and we're going to use this on this song. It's like, it's more just like how you hit and then suddenly it can be quieter on this arm and this, you know, all of the sensitivity. Danny is like that. He's that kind of musician where it's just, he has just this ingrained sensitivity to everything that's going on around him. Uh, musically and it, it never fails it's just a hundred percent going with that sensitivity all the time well and that probably allows you to play with dynamics in certain ways too that can be exciting to present the music right i mean that's yeah that's nice <laughs> i'm here to say dynamics they're nice <laughs> that's the thing about drums in a band you know drums are sort of the conductor right they, they're like uh they they determine the, the volume but not just the volume. They determine the intensity and then the relaxation. And again, like we don't, I don't recall ever having to uh, ask Danny to do something quieter or louder or, you know, touch this way or that way. Just normal things that you do in a band, even as a band leader, I'm, I'm directing yeah. that stuff all the time. But Danny, never, not ever. Well, and it's, it can be, you know, different players can bring out different parts of the composition too. Right, just based on like you know small subtle things that they do, and it can change the overall. You know, it's like you put it all in a cauldron, and uh, you know, certain certain spices, certain vegetables, they're they're fantastic. And then sometimes you put in one, and it's like, oh man, that's really overpowering. <laughs> oh yes, oh, yes. And it smells bad the whole time. We don't need to talk about those. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, so then, uh, well, I, and uh, yeah, and there's there's folks in the chat box shouting out Chess, who uh, I, I just adore Chess. I think Chess is a freaking astounding talent. Okay. He used to he used to work at the Andronicos across the street from my apartment, and I used to talk to him uh, all the time just about like punk rock or whatever. And then it didn't even, I didn't even know he played music until like the first year that we've been talking. And like, I think it just like, I was wearing a butthole server shirt or something along those lines, but uh, astounding drummer, like really interesting, interesting feel, uh, cool player. Yeah. He, 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 he's another one like uh, where it's kind of a, about pairing him with musicians. He, his, his ability to, um, Chameleon's not the right word, but he has a, he he adapts for sure, big time. He adapts not not so much in the dynamics, but in the weird ideas. Like I can throw, I definitely use him for my hardest ever musical ideas, because he takes them like a you know, like a pit bull just grabs onto them. If it's a challenging thing that is hard to to deal with, he's the guy who who can end up making it natural and that's yeah. what I need a lot in secret cheese thing I, I need things to sound natural i need them i always need them to sound natural i hate i don't want that that band to ever sound like proggy or complicated like you know math stuff yet it has the most complex substructures in some of some of what's happening and yeah but uh, you're not sitting there with a the bullhorn announcing it like i mean the the the, the the example I always bring up, there's a, I'm not going to say who it was, but there's this band. After every song, they would be like, uh, you may have noticed that song was in this time signature. And then it was like, oh, God. They were like announcing the time signature. I was like, oh. but for the listeners, I just pulled a Bud's Wire. Uh, I was like, stop. I have secondhand embarrassment. Stop. And like it made me actually like 
I, the music again. I'm not gonna say who it was. I enjoyed the music, but I was like, ugh, it's yeah. like somebody farted in a room. Totally. Yeah, that's a that's a, like the worst than garlic breath. It's more like a fart. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> disgusting and even to the idea of odd time signatures like this this weird fetish for like oh we're we're playing outside of four four time it's off yeah now you want a cookie what do you come on <laughs> what's good for you <laughs> if you're such a radical then why do you call me odd it's not odd yeah. it's normal like you know it's really easy right and that's the thing it's like it is the, the whole thing of it being a contest to see who can do the, the more advanced thing. anyway Chess is like this great weapon because I can I can do this kind of multi-layered polyrhythmic stuff with him, um, get him to understand it, get him to sort of own it. Um, but then once he owns it, let him develop it into into um, something that he he then feels comfortable enough with that he can play around with it. And the best thing about yeah. chess is when he's flipping things around. And, you know, but not doing it to, to, to mess with you, but like, you know, he's comfortable enough with it, like a jazz player that now he can, he can improvise with it. He works it. within the framework and like puts a cool kind of spin on it. We're like, whoa, I didn't think that was okay. All right. Yeah, that's. It becomes his voice. That's what I always want from musicians is when they take, when I give them something, that they can digest it enough and then put their voice into it. That generally means they own it to the point where they can flip it around and do, do their own thing with it. Chess is definitely the guy for that when it comes to you know, tricky stuff. And also, man, he's a fucking monster jazz player. And the, oh, the, yeah. the best thing about him, I, I think it, my favorite thing about him is his conga playing and how, how well informed his approach to that is from his many years, decades now of playing the Haitian music which is really, 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 really deep. Uh, I don't know, man. He's he's a really unique cat. Yeah, good dude. I hope his ears are burning right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Mentor's record. He does a good impression of Il Duce. Oh, really? That's yeah. I would. That's a sentence I didn't expect to hear. But okay, right on. Uh, <laughs> I believe. I mean, I believe it. You know, you, you're you. We were talking all this idea about you know different players bringing out different things. Um, you know, I feel like I'd be remiss, even though you and I have talked about in the past. Uh, since this is your first time being on the show, I do want to kind of talk about the Faith and War record, the King for a Day, Fool for a Lifetime, because I think that's <laughs> there's the world of you know largely that that I travel in and this show travels in uh, of music, and then there's like another like larger world that occasionally there'll be intersections of Venn diagrams, and occasionally I'm reminded how much of that when I get someone that comes in from that world. And I feel like that's a largely misunderstood record. And I, I kind of want to jump past some of the kindergarten level stuff, but I mean, you kind of were looking at that, like, um, you know, like what can I bring to this? Like as, as an experiment. Right. And, and they were, <laughs> I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but they were like, maybe kind of looking for something more permanent in a way. Um, can you just speak a little bit, maybe overall to that record, how you approached it? what you brought into it and what kind of situation that was, you know, without damaging any personal reputations or anything. <laughs> it it, it didn't happen because, you no, know, they were looking for a, for a full-time guitar player. And that, that's kind of what I signed up for when I joined. Um, although Patton had, had said to me before I even started with them, like after the audition tape that I made, he's like, you know, I don't know if you, if you really want to do this. It's not, it's not an ideal situation for the, for a guitar player to be in. I didn't know what he was talking about until much later, um, which is nothing so terrible. But the main thing- This is a lot of personalities. There's a lot, a lot of personalities in general, personalities as, as uh, instruments too. Like that was a lot of things coming at the, the compositional process, I would imagine. Well, that was, in a way, that was the cool part about it because it was, you do have these incredibly strong personalities. And I, I just love the, the relationship between the super powerful drums, the bass interlocking with that, and then the keyboards sort of floating above all that. I've always, that was the first thing that made me love Faith No More back in what, whatever it was, 86 or something. Um, so the role of the guitar was always, you know, doing kind of primitive metal riffing and they wanted to get away from that. 
That's right. why they're hiring me. They wanted me. To they, they did that. <laughs> you know, there's no reason to keep doing it. Not the Ramones. Exactly. I'll, I'll praise the Ramones. <laughs> totally. And yeah, so I, I was sort of of two minds on that because some of the music that they gave me, I thought really was asking for the primitive guitar approach, which I think was, you know, some of them agree with that. Some of them are like, you know, uh, Mike Borden is like, you know, definitely kind of egging me on saying, you know, that um, he's encouraging me saying, you know, J Jim Martin, he has these big giant boots that you got to fill. So you got to do some of this, this balls out kind of metal stuff. So I took that makes perfect sense to the faith no more I knew. But, and then Billy is saying, yeah, but you know, we want to do more, you know, we could, we could do this kind of R and B stuff. We could actually yeah, yeah, do yeah. good. Like we can actually do some of these things. I'm like, okay, cool. And then Patton's like, you know, some of this stuff's just got to be this really straight ahead kind of punk rock, more like garage aggressive thing. Like <laughs> I'm just like hearing different things from everywhere. <laughs> it's like a restaurant with five different sous chefs. <laughs> and they're all talking to me kind of separately too. So <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it was on me to problem solve the guitar situation in the band, which I embraced. Like I thought that was the sort of the cool thing about the gig. Cause it was a, a lot of that is again, I'm serving their vision. So I'm putting whatever my own ideas might be aside, but frankly, no, Puffy was right. You have to assert yourself and you have to assert yourself and trust your instincts. So right. once I kind of figured that out, like I, 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 instead of just asking questions constantly, what do you guys want? You know, what do you want? What do you want? I finally sort of honed in on what the guitar was going to be song by song. So I kind of was schizophrenic, like, switching hats every every two <laughs> right. sombrero uh hard hat yeah exactly <laughs> and i was trying to keep it like not not like that you know the the part i sacrificed for myself was i was trying to just be more you know consistent but i ended up doing the hat switching thing again worked out fine everything was cool with that and uh i thought the music turned out good on the record it wasn't a good situation in the end for, for me um, because they were at this point in their careers where they were, you know, they had had that Angel Dust record, which had done not as well as it should have, considering the, right. the, the kind of music that was on that record. That was a, like the, the label, I feel like, really dropped the ball on that one. But it's also, they had this very standoffish relationship kind of snotty relationship with their record label at that point. A bit of a problem child, but maybe as a, uh, as termed by the, by the label. Yeah. <laughs> with, and then, but it's weird because then by the mid nineties, the labels are, are quite used to that. At least that's a selling point. Like the band is supposed to be the snotty ones and the label's supposed to be the big, bad, evil record company. You know? Right. Everyone's filling their role. Yeah. <laughs> And it's crazy because during the for day, it was that it was the opposite. Like the attitude of the the band was more like, let's you know, let's play ball and let's like try to work with the record company. And it was just a fucking weird moment, a really weird and awkward moment between the label and the band, and it, it created tons of tension uh, between all of them. There was a lot of it was a difficult. It was hard for me, like. I didn't understand the interpersonal dynamics of the band. Right. I just felt like it was going nowhere good. And that I was getting kind of, it, I was going to get pulled into stuff that wasn't going to turn out good in the end. Mm. I wanted to protect my relationship with Mike at that point. And, you know, so I'm just like, you know, all right. I st as soon as we're done with the recording, I, I stepped away so they'd have time to find somebody for the tour. And um, yeah, that was the end of that. I mean, made for an interesting record. It's like I feel like that record's actually aged fairly well uh, for a lot of the reasons you mentioned. Like um, maybe almost accidentally, yeah. You know, in that way, you never quite know what the future is going to hold. But I think, you know, in, in much the same way that the world's kind of come around to some of the bungle stuff, uh, in, in the same way that uh, that Faith No More record, I think, kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's some some stuff you listen to and it's like, oh, that sounds like that time, okay, and that's fine. You know, there's there's something to be said for being of the time, being ephemeral, but. I think it's I think it's aged pretty well, and it's and it's a it's a fascinating record, and one of the reasons why is because all the stuff you mentioned of just being yeah, it sounds like a, like a pinball getting bounced around, <laughs> all these different ideas and styles. <laughs> Interesting how the 
the, the reception differed around the world for that record too, because it was certainly embraced. I, I would say that it's like in Chile, that would probably be the number one faith no right. record. And some other countries too, I think Australia, there's, you know, the United States was the place where it was very much a sleeper, but I think that that's yeah. where, where it's had this kind of maybe second life um, but yeah, outside the U.S., it, it did a lot better than than, uh, than here. So it's almost too nuanced for that time, which was a very unnuanced <laughs> period of American music, which is saying a lot. That was a fucking <laughs> horrible time. The nineties are terrible, fucking. Horrible. <laughs> I, I, when I hear the nineties now, like most of the, when you hear the the music that was popular, I hated it then. Right. I still fucking hate it now. But the thing is, I hear a lot of the popular music from the 80s. Like if I hear Duran Duran, I hated it then. I love it now. I can't believe how good Duran Duran was. You know, a lot of a lot of 80s music that like so much thought went into that just went past me. But I listen to 90s shit and man, it is fucking terrible. Do you think it maybe? Yeah. Well, yeah, because because some of that's sort of when it's presented to you as this like overarching you know hits you over the head with a sledgehammer ubiquity the natural reaction especially let's let's be clear as a younger person usually like well screw that no that, yeah, that yeah. sucks and and some of it's like god with these gated drums where it's like oh why did you think that was a good idea you know production techniques and things along those lines but ultimately it's like well a good song is a good song exactly and also uh, bullshitting I would say that there was a lot of musical bullshitting going on in the 90s that in the 80s, that songwriting and the execution of the song and the production of the song, they were all fully behind the, the intention of the song. Right. And in the 90s, you really lose that. You, you have like a producer coming in and like, you know, I feel like it's the musicians essentially that were bullshitting mostly. And producers are just coming in and polishing it and making it sound good. But it's really the musician's fault, to be honest, not the labels. Well not yeah the, the musicians were totally full of shit well people got tied up with being a sound band oh it's this it's the correct sound to catch people's attention or whatever and then yeah, yeah. It's weird i mean i might be overstating it but that's how i feel about it still uh, a couple interesting questions in the chat box uh <laughs> Uh, can you ask Trey to clarify why they specifically call it the Raging Wrath of the Easter Bunny demo and not simply the Raging Wrath of the Easter Bunny? <laughs> this is a very pedantic question, but I think it's funny. So It's a good question. Uh, I think we even asked ourselves that question and we, you know, just sort of came up with the thing that this is a, a presentation of a demo. Right. And the thing about that demo is that it was a demo for nothing to begin with because there were no venues in Eureka to give a demo to. <laughs> <laughs> right, like, you're making this demo and who's, who is this demo for, right? <laughs> we never sent it to any record companies. You know, right? yeah. I, don't, I don't think we ever sent it to any, we just put it, you know, we sent it to friends and to other metalheads. So it, was, it, was, it, it wasn't a demo to begin with. So now we're doing this cover version of a, what was called a demo. And the, the demo is sort of inscribed in the, in the, the history of the, the piece because it's a, it's a kind of a lie in a way. And we wanted to do <laughs> that entire state of mind. Like, okay, it's a demo for nothing. Okay, well, here's a record. And it's also a demo. I don't know. It's, it's like confusing. it doesn't make sense. It had to stay there. It was just too good. Raging Wrath of the Easter Bunny demo. Yeah, that's well, and it's it's almost like Kiss Alive, right? It doesn't actually say live in the record, and there's overdubs all over the place. But that's kind of like you're in on the joke a little bit if you if if you know. Exactly. Uh, and also in the in the song Hypocrites, it's part of the lyrics. It's yelled out one line on both the original version and the new one. It's yelled, "The Raging Wrath of the Easter Bunny demo." So it's part of the lyrics. <laughs> it was, it was part of the, I, okay, I got to listen back to it now. I'm going to listen for that. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, where so just real quick, and, and I, I want to. Unfortunately, um, we're getting to wrap it up fairly soon here. But how did how did you know playing with um, with Trevor and Mike? Like how how did that relationship start? How did that friendship start? Like did you start off as friends first? Did you start off as players, kind of learning to be friends? Like 
I was aware of those two guys. I think I'd seen their band Gemini play at senior class night or something like that at the high school. Um, and I knew Trevor was in the PM jazz band, which I think I don't, I didn't qualify for yet. I was in the AM jazz band. Maybe that's college, but there were two levels, two levels of jazz band and I was in the shitty one and Trevor was in the good one. I was like one year behind those guys or two, one. Uh, but I, Trevor and I had a music theory class together. You can believe it. In high school, we had a music theory class. This great wow. John Minky is a great teacher. I was going to say, whoever that teacher is, is a lot to be proud of. <laughs> he was amazing. And our, our real mentor at that time was Dan Horton. He was the, the conductor and the, you know, the band leader of all of the ensembles. Um, and he let me like use the practice rooms on elective periods. And I would just sit there on the piano writing music the whole time. So amazing. Such a fertile environment he created for us. Um, so I met Trevor in that kind of milieu in the music department or whatever of our high school. And I think, I don't want this to be revisionist history, but I think it's true that what got us talking was he brought in Anthrax, uh, Panic, the song Panic. <laughs> How funny. On the, on the listening day, you know? Right, yeah. I'm bringing in like, you know, Stravinsky or whatever. And he, he brought in Panic and I was like, holy shit. Uh, I knew those guys were playing speed metal in their band, Fiend. So I, you know, I sort of knew Trevor and then I saw Fiend when my uh, more sort of melodic power metal band, Torture, opened up for them. Mm -hmm. So that was like our the first time we had all seen each other play. Like right. Really seen each other play. And uh, from there, it was like, okay, let's, they left Fiend and uh, Torture and those two guys just kind of merged together and became Mr. Bungle. Last question from the chat box. Uh, there's a question about the lyrics that are going to be supplied in a separate PDF or available in any way, shape, or form. Is that a go hassle Mike Patton question, or do you have any idea? Yeah, it might be a go hassle Mike Patton question because I'm not. I don't know what's going on with the lyrics at all. I saw some of them got online, but I was like, where the hell did these come? How, who got those to post them online? It's weird. I, I don't know what's going on with the lyrics. You got a. Uh... You're going to play this this music. There's like a virtual live concert happening. The time of this recording, it's actually happening very soon. I think it's a Saturday, the 31st for Halloween, right? Yes. Uh, and where should people go for that? They should go to mrbungle.com or where is there a specific site or anything they should go to? Yeah, I think it's it's either mrbungle.live or ipecac.live, Mr. Bungle, something like that. It, it's, it's called The Night They Came Home. <laughs> well, and that's a. Uh, I think Trevor posted a thing about uh, <laughs> Halloween three, right? The Halloween three was there was like a. Um, it was it shot there or something along those lines. It was Halloween three was shot. Uh, a, a big part of it was shot in Lolita, California, which is about just down the just down the road. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's um. I don't know why that's of all the things I can ask. I'm asking about fucking Halloween three, but you know, hey, you know, whatever. It's. <laughs> <laughs> It's very important. In fact, uh, Secret Chiefs, we did a mix. We did a, a version of Halloween that we called Season of the Glitch, which is a reference to... That's right, yeah! <laughs> and I just put out a thing called Horrorathon, which, it, which uses Halloween 3 uh, as a kind of a spine to weave together all these different horror elements for Secret Chiefs music. So it's like, there's a lot of Lolita on the brain right now. Lolita, California. Trey, this has been awesome. Thanks so much for coming on and doing the show. It's so great to talk to you. And um, you put out a, a hell of a uh, demo record. <laughs> it's really interesting. And I think people should tune into that live, that live thing. It's, it's going to be worth your time. Super, super, super fun. And I have a question for you. I just, that, this is killing me. When's the last time you received a demo? Oh my God. Uh, like, like a, like a fully realized thing or like an MP3 sent over the, like when somebody says like, well, we're trying to make a record, but here's our demo. When's the yeah. last time that happened? Years, years and years. <laughs> right? It's decades. The demos are the records now. <laughs> yeah, there's no such thing anymore. Uh, Trey, last question I ask everybody that comes on. It's the only can question I have, which is you can answer it any way you like, but why do you do what you do? Oh, man. Uh, it, it's, I would probably um, be beating up, trying to beat up my wife. She'd kick my ass if I tried, but you know, I'd be just bundled up. If I didn't do what I do, my God, I'd be in jail. I would be, you would know my name for having done 
horrible, horrible <laughs> for the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah. The good thing I do what I do is just watch out. Uh, Trey, this has been great, man. Thanks so much for doing the show. It's been a pleasure. Man, likewise. Great talking to you, man. All right, take it easy. You too. Oh, there he goes. ProtonicReversal.com.
Knights of Damkar. That's uh, Knights of Damkar. Um, Secret Chiefs. Secret. Ugh, boy, I'm off to a great start here. Secret Chiefs three. That's the kickoff song on Book M. That came out in 2001. That's a. Uh, that's Trey and company. Before that, we had a little band called Mr. Bungle. Perhaps you've heard of them. Uh, with a song off of uh, California, that is. Are we going? None of them knew they were robots. Is this thing on? Before that was a racist, which is off of another Mr. Bungle record. The Raging Wrath of the Easter Bunny Demo. That's the name of the record, y'all. <laughs> uh, Erasist. And that's, uh, you know, you can find all that stuff on the normal places you find music. If you want to see that music played live in our own personal timeline, There's a Mr. Bungle dot live uh, live stream on Halloween. So if you're signing off, Mr. and Mrs. America, all the ships at sea. I guess if you're hearing this now, <laughs> anyone within the sound of my voice, it may, it may very well be in the past. But anyway, name of the show is Come News on Sportonic Reversal. Thank you so much for listening to it. Thanks so much I've for Trace Bruance. 50,000 watts of power. This show airs weekly, or sometimes more than weekly, on RadioNope.com. ProtonicReversal.com for the archives. Broadcasted, RadioNope.com, podcasted everywhere. This microphone turns sound into electricity. Thanks for the shares, the reviews, the subscribing, all that. It all Can helps. You hear me now? Out on Route 128, in the dark and lonely. Take it easy. I got my radio on. Take it Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now?
really broadcasting if there's no one there to receive. It's the end of radio. As we come to the close of our broadcast day. Emergency!